Hello, and welcome to the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. It's the Halloween season, and it's required by podcasting law, as stated in Section 107-14-8, that every movie podcast must do a horror-themed podcast during the month of October. Last year, at the suggestion of Jeff Townsend, also known as the Podcast Father and host of the Indie Podcaster Podcast, I did a brief history on the Halloween movies. This year, at the suggestion of Jeff Townsend, also known as the Podcast Father and host of the Indie Podcaster Podcast, we're going to do a dive into another successful horror franchise of the 1980s. And in case you weren't paying attention from the title of this episode, this is a brief history of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. But before we can get to the movies, we first need to get to know the man behind the series, the man who created Freddy Krueger, the man who was able to, intentionally or not, launch not one, not two, but three successful horror movie franchises, the man, the myth, the legend, Wes Craven. Like many of the greatest people in the entertainment industry, Wesley Earl Craven was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Side note, the man who founded Cleveland, General Moses Cleveland, a veteran of the American Revolutionary War, is my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. True story. My dad, Don, was the seventh generation of my family born in Cleveland and the last of my family to be born in Cleveland. His favorite thing about being from Cleveland, he says, is being far from Cleveland. I actually like Cleveland, but to be fair, I don't remember when we lived there as a small child, and I've only been there for about 15 days in the past 40 years, but I digress. Craven was a rather intelligent man. After graduating from high school, Craven earned degrees at Wheaton College, double majoring in English and in psychology, and then earning his master's in philosophy from Johns Hopkins. In the mid-1960s, Craven would teach English at a college in Pennsylvania, then move on to be a humanities professor in upstate New York. In the late 1960s, at the urging of his friend Steve Chapin, brother of future Cats in the Cradle singer Harry Chapin, Craven quit academia to become involved in film. Like almost everyone who doesn't come from a wealthy and heavily connected family, Craven didn't start out as a director. Wes Craven would, for the first several years of his film career, write and edit pornographic films. Since he used a variety of pseudonyms while working in the porn industry, and since he never has fully publicly acknowledged his work in the industry, outside of appearing in the 2005 documentary Inside Deep Throat, where he hinted at having made quote-unquote many hardcore X-rated films, we'll probably never know which pornographic films from the 60s and 70s he made. But he would be successful enough in his porn endeavors that in 1971, he and his producer, Sean S. Cunningham, would be given $90,000 by Hallmark Releasing to make another movie, having had some success with the duo's previous film, a soft horror sex movie called Together. At first, Night of Vengeance was going to be a graphic horror film, something meant to push the boundaries of what had been seen on movie screen since the abolishment of the production code a few years earlier. Unlike many of the movies being released before and after the fall of the production code, Craven wanted to show the violence being depicted on screen in great detail. Craven felt that too many movies were glamorizing violence and were giving the viewing public the wrong impression of death, especially during the time of the then-current Vietnam War. Ironically, the film would be in production when Dirty Harry, featuring Clint Eastwood as a violent cop on the beat in San Francisco who loved to shoot first and ask questions later, was released in the theaters and becoming one of the most successful releases of the year. The film was full of mostly unknown at the time actors, including future Karate Kid sensei Martin Cove, who played a local deputy sheriff, and Steve Miner, who would become a horror legend in his own right by becoming the only director to make both a Halloween movie and a Friday the 13th movie, as a hippie who taunts Cove's deputy. But after filming was completed, and Craven and Cunningham went to work on editing the film, it was decided that while many of the gruesome practical effects looked great on screen, that maybe the film should be toned down a bit to try and capture a larger audience. Before its initial theatrical release in August of 1972, Night of Vengeance would go through a series of title changes and test screenings, including Sex Crime of the Century and Krug and Company, 
before a marketing expert friend of Cunningham suggested Last House on the Left, which Craven thought was a horrible name for the movie. But the name would stick. And the film with promotional key art that warned the film was, quote, not recommended for persons under 30, unquote, would become something of a hit for Hallmark, grossing more than $3 million between August 1972 and March 1973. And you'd think some smart producer in Hollywood would, would snap up a young filmmaker with a decent hit under his belt. But Craven would go nearly five more years before getting his follow-up to Last Townless on the left made. But boy, did it make an impact. One of the reasons he had trouble getting a second movie made was that, ironically, when you see where his career went, Wes Craven did not want to make another horror film. And that's exactly what Hollywood wanted from him. Craven would hold out as long as he could, but money was starting to get tight and he needed to work. So he would hook up with his friend, producer Peter Locke, and Sean S. Cunningham to come up with a modern twist on the brother's grim story, Hansel and Gretel. If Craven needed to return to horror, he wanted to make something more sophisticated than Last House on the Left. It was while doing research at the New York Public Library about truly horrific things that humans have done to other humans, Craven would learn about Alexander Sawney Bean, the head of a 16th century Scottish clan who reportedly murdered and cannibalized more than 1,000 people. Craven would mix the two stories together to come up with Blood Relations, The Sun Wars, set several years in the future, 1984 to be exact, and told the story of a family stranded in the middle of nowhere in New Jersey who must protect themselves against a family of cannibals. But when it came time to shoot the movie in October of 1976, Craven would need to rewrite portions of his script to reflect a new shooting location, California's Mojave Desert. Filming conditions were brutal, as temperatures would rise to as high as 120 degrees during the day, before dropping to as low as 30 degrees at night. When the film was finally released in theaters as The Hills Have Eyes in July of 1977, it would become a horror sensation. Playing in secondary markets like Tucson and Tacoma at first, the film would gross more than $2 million in its first five months, which doesn't sound like a lot at first until you realize it never played in more than 100 screens on any given week during that time frame, and that ticket prices were only $1.50 or $2 in most of those markets. It would finally open in Los Angeles and New York in October 1977, and after several months of theaters, The Hills of Eyes would gross $25 million, nearly 36 times its $700,000 budget. And once again, it would take Craven years to set up another project. And once again, he would be working in the horror genre. Deadly Blessing would be his first film with a seven-figure budget, and his first working with name actors, including Academy Award winner Ernest Borgnine, Jeff East, who played the young Superman in the 1978 Richard Donner classic, and Marin Jensen of Battlestar Galactica fame. It would also be the first major role for a young actress only seen once before on screen as a dream girl in Woody Allen's Stardust Memories, Sharon Stone. Originally budgeted at $2 million, the producers of the film were able to raise enough money pre-selling worldwide pay television and syndication rights to the Showtime cable channel, based solely off of Craven's name, to increase the budget to $3 million. But when it came time to release the film in the United States, Original distributor Universal Pictures would delay the release of the film several times from its original planned March 1981 release until it ultimately dropped the completed film altogether. United Artists would pick the film up and release it into a thousand theaters on August 14, 1981. Reviews were bad and business was not as strong for Deadly Plessing as it had been for The Hills of Eyes. But it would show a bit of profit for everyone involved grossing $8.3 million after four months. Craven would finally be given the chance to work outside the horror genre with his next film. Sort of. Swamp Thing was an adaptation of the DC comic superhero series, but just because of the nature of the character, a one-time scientist who becomes a monster when his laboratory is sabotaged by an evil paramilitary leader trying to protect a secret formula, it would still kind of fall into the horror genre. The budget for Swamp Thing was only two and a half million dollars, a half million less than he had for Deadly Blessing, despite the makeup effects heavy title character. 
but Craven would complete the film on time and on budget, but, like a deadly blessing, would perform only moderately well, grossing a little over $5 million. Which brings us finally to our main topic, A Nightmare on Elm Street. After completing work on Swamp Thing in late 1981, Wes Craven knew he needed to do something big to get him back in the game. Something fresh and original. Something that would knock people's socks off. So he did something he had never done before in his career. Write a spec script. Sidebar. A spec script is a screenplay that was not previously commissioned by a producer without any prior attachments or deals. The spec is short for speculative. One writes a spec script in the hopes of finding a producer or distributor who likes the story and screenplay enough to purchase it from you and your representatives. While every studio in town rejected the screenplay, the small New York City-based independent distributor New Line Cinema would purchase the screenplay, intending to make A Nightmare on Elm Street one of the first movies that they would produce themselves. Raven had originally conceived of the story when he heard news reports of Laotian immigrants living in various places across the United States who had each died after having the same nightmare. But much of the film would be somewhat drawn from Craven's own experiences. Freddy Krueger, the villain of the film, was based on an elderly man the young Craven once saw one night walking on the sidewalk outside of his home. As the young boy watched the older man walk, he would become startled when the gentleman stopped and stared directly at him. But it wasn't the sudden stop that startled Craven. It was how the man stared at him with dead eyes that fronted a dead soul. That's how the man made Craven feel, and in Freddy Krueger, the director would finally find a way to use that in one of his movies. The name Freddy Krueger itself was also from Craven's past. In elementary school, Craven was regularly bullied by an older kid named Fred Krueger, and in this vile child murderer, the director would once again find to use that in one of his movies. I say use again because the name of the main villain in The Last House on the Left, Krug, is also based on Craven's young tormentor. New Line Cinema had been founded in June of 1967 by Robert Shea as a packager of older films and shorts for college film societies. One of the films Shea would license for these packages in the early 1970s was a little-remembered propaganda film from 1936 called Reefer Madness. The film was hilariously bad, and modern college kids, often high on reefer when watching it, would make it a somewhat hit. New Line would make enough money from Reefer Madness, where Shea could start acquiring movies from filmmakers and releasing them into commercial theaters. One beneficiary of this sudden flutch of cash to New Line was Baltimore filmmaker John Waters. New Line would acquire his 1970 comedy Multiple Maniacs for theatrical release, beginning a nearly 20-year relationship where New Line would release every John Waters movie from Multiple Maniacs in 1970 to Hairspray in 1988, and again in 2004 with A Dirty Shame, Waters' last film to date. New Line would decide to make A Nightmare on Elm Street, one of the first films that it would fully finance. If only it were that simple. Despite the fact that the film would only be budgeted for around $700,000, and New Line had recently found another success in the re-release of Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which the company had just picked up after the governmental foreclosure of that film's original distributor. But New Line would find themselves in a bit of a cash crunch, which almost caused the cancellation of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Eventually, New Line would end up securing enough financing from other production companies, and, according to Robert Shea, a Yugoslavian guy whose girlfriend wanted to be in the movie, that they would not have any direct investment in the film they would also be able to raise the budget to $1.1 million. For the lead role of Nancy Thompson, Craven wanted someone who was not, quote-unquote, a typical Hollywood starlet. He wanted someone believable as an average teenager who finds herself in an unusual and horrific situation. More than 200 actresses would audition for the role, including Courtney Cox, future Growing Pains co-star Tracy Gold, who was only 14 at the time of her audition, Jennifer Grey, and Demi Moore. In the end, the film's casting director would push for Heather Langenkamp, whom she had already met when the actress had auditioned for The Last Starfighter 
and Night of the Comet, losing both roles to Catherine Mary Stewart. Langenkamp was attending Stanford at the time of the audition, driving down to Los Angeles for the tryout, and she was looking to line something up for her time off from school during the summer. Langenkamp would get the role not only because of her girl-next-door looks, but also how she played off another actress at the audition, Amanda Weiss, who would be cast as Nancy's best friend, Tina. For Glenn, Nancy's boyfriend, Craven had originally constructed the character to be a big, blonde, beach jock football player. But Craven was open to other ideas. It is said that Charlie Sheen was offered the role, but Sheen's agent reportedly turned the offer down, as Sheen's agent wanted $2,500 per week for his client, and the production could only offer $1,142. Craven would audition more people, including Nicolas Cage, John Cusack, C. Thomas Howell, Mark Patton, Brad Pitt, and Kiefer Sutherland. Jackie Earl Haley, the star of the Bad News Bears and Breaking Away, would also audition, but the role would go to a guy who had never acted before, who had accompanied Haley to the audition, Johnny Depp. Craven's 15-year-old daughter Jessica happened to come into the offices where her dad was holding auditions, saw Depp in the waiting room, and she became instantly smitten with him. You must cast him, Dad, she intoned. So he did. But the hardest part to cast would be the film's villain, Freddy Krueger. David Warner, the fantastic British character actor who had been so memorable in The Omen, Time After Time, Time Bandits, and Tron, was cast as Krueger and even had started working with the makeup team to be fitted with the various prosthetics to play the horribly disfigured psycho but there would be a scheduling conflict with another project he had previously signed on to, forcing the actor to drop out. Kane Hodder, the stuntman who would later find fame as Jason Voorhees in four of the Friday the 13th movies, would also try out for the role, but Craven wasn't sure Hodder was right for it. Something was off. Enter Robert England. At five foot nine, he wasn't as tall or imposing as either Hodder or Warner but he came prepared for his audition by playing up his lack of stature. At the suggestion of a friend, England showed up looking like a human version of a rat-weasel hybrid. Hair slicked back, black cigarette ash smeared across his eyelids. According to England, he just sat there in a chair, listening to Craven describe the character, but playing as if he were Klaus Kinski instead of Robert England, hardly even saying a word. He got the part, it would be his first starring role after 10 years in the business, and it would become the role that would define his career. Craven did add two minor stars in supporting roles as Nancy's parents. John Saxon, who had starred alongside Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon, and had played a policeman in the original 1974 Black Christmas, would play Nancy's cop dad, while Rene Blakely, the Oscar-nominated star of Robert Altman's Nashville, played Nancy's alcoholic mother. Both characters would end up having far more to do with what's happening in the story than most parental characters ever do. Production on the film would begin in Los Angeles on June 11, 1984, which lasted for 32 days. Raven would push himself and his crew to make the best film they could despite the limited budget. The same rotating set that was used for Tina's death sequence would be redressed for Glenn's infamous blood geyser death. In a number of scenes, red-colored water would replace the typical movie set blood because water is less expensive than the corn syrup usually used to create movie blood. Robert Shea, who was producing the film for his company, would come up with one of the nightmare scenes used in the film, that of the melting staircase in Nancy's dream, which came out of one of Shea's own nightmares. And Sean S. Cunningham, Craven's producer on The Last House on the Left, who had produced and directed the first Friday the 13th movie, would come in to help Craven with some of the second unit work during Nancy's dream sequence. One problem Craven would have with his producer Robert Shea was with the ending of the film. Craven's original script had Nancy quote-unquote killing Freddy by simply no longer believing in him, stripping him of his power over her. Then she wakes up, realizing it was all just a dream. She gets ready for school and she leaves her house on an unusually foggy morning. A car pulls up next to her in front of her house with Glenn and Tina and her other friends inside her. At first startled because all her dead friends 
are no longer dead. Nancy gets in the car. It drives off into the fog as Nancy's mother watches from just outside the front door. Is this also part of Nancy's dream? A dream inside a dream? But Shay wanted something else. He thought Freddy should be driving the car and that the kids should be screaming as they drove away. The pair would work on a series of other endings, but they'd only shoot one, the one that ends the film. Craven got most of what he wanted, and Shay got the shocker ending he wanted. Craven knew Shay wanted the film ready for Halloween 1984, but they would settle for a November 9th release date, in part because that would give Craven four months to sculpt the final film instead of barely three and in part because, even by 1984, it was apparent that horror movies tied to the Halloween season usually die very quickly after Halloween. It would also give Craven time to satisfy the MPAA rating board, who would give the film an X rating twice before Craven cut enough of the gore out to secure the R rating, about 12 seconds worth, because New Line was still going through a money crunch at the time. A Nightmare on Elm Street would open in only 165 screens, including 77 in the New York metropolitan area and 51 in the Los Angeles metro area. And despite opening up against the third George Burns' Oh God movie, the Demi Moore John Cryer rom-com No Small Affair and the first Silent Night Deadly Night, A Nightmare on Elm Street would open in 10th place with $1.27 million in ticket sales. Its $7,703 per screen average would be the highest of all the films in the top 15. In week two, the film would add another 109 screens and come in seventh place with $1.63 million. Once again, it would have the highest per screen average of all the movies in the top 15. In fact, despite never playing on more than 274 screens during its first three months in theaters, the film would regularly be first or second in terms of per screen average even if it never got higher than 7th place in actual gross. The film would have legs. In its 11th weekend, January 18th through 20th, 1985, the film would come in 2nd place with $1.71 million worth of tickets sold from 377 screens. As it moved from territory to territory across the country, the film would steadily gross $1.1 to $1.5 million every weekend for most weeks until the audience started to drop in early February 1985. The film would play all through the winter and early spring, and when it was all said and done, A Nightmare on Elm Street, the little $1.1 million movie with no stars and a small theatrical release, had grossed $25.5 million in the United States. Two things Wes Craven knew once A Nightmare on Elm Street had become a success. One, Robert Shea would want a sequel, and two, Wes Craven didn't want anything to do with it. Another problem for creative types when it comes to selling your spec script is that you no longer own your characters. You no longer own your story. Wes Craven may have created Freddy Krueger, but he did not own Freddy Krueger. Craven understood this, and he wished to Shea well on the sequel. The first pitch Robert Shea would like from various screenwriters about a second Nightmare on Elm Street movie came from Leslie Boehm, a former bassist with the Los Angeles pop rock group Sparks, whose father was a screenwriter himself. Shea loved Boehm's idea of creating an homage to Rosemary's Baby with a new family moving into the Thompson house, a teenage boy, his pregnant mom, and new stepfather, and the spirit of Freddy Krueger getting into the mother's womb and possessing the fetus. Sounds familiar, right? We'll get there. But there was one person who wasn't so keen on the concept at the time. Sarah Risher, an executive at New Line who was the co-producer of A Nightmare on Elm Street and would be assuming those duties again on the sequel, saw the merit in the idea but didn't want to go there just now. You see, no one knew until she said something herself at the meeting that she was pregnant with her first child and wouldn't feel comfortable being on the set of a movie about a demonic fetus possession. So they would take the basic story of a new family moving into the Thompson house and then have Freddy possess the teenage boy instead. David Chaskin was hired to write the screenplay, and Jack Shoulder, who had made the 1982 horror film Alone in the Dark for New Line, was hired to direct. Both Chaskin and Shoulder would contact Wes Craven for advice, and Craven would confer with both. 
Chaskin would say it was Craven who would suggest to him to focus less on Jesse, the teenager being possessed by Freddy, and focus more on Lisa, Jesse's girlfriend, and the only person who seemed to understand what was happening to Jesse. Shoulder initially considered not doing the movie, but it had been three years since he had directed Alone in the Dark without any further offers, and directing a successful sequel to a hit film could lead to better things. And he wouldn't necessarily be wrong. But we're getting ahead of ourselves again. For the lead role of Jesse Walsh, Robert Shea would choose Mark Patton, who had auditioned for the role of Glenn the previous year, and was Shea's first choice before Johnny Depp caught his daughter's eye. Like with Nancy in the first film, the filmmakers would cast a couple of cult actors to play the parents. This time, regular movie cowboy Clue Gulliger and Peyton Place co-star Hope Lang played the parents. Freddy's Revenge would also be the first film for actress Kim Myers, who played Lisa, and Marshall Bell, for whom this would be his first major role. One person who wasn't going to be returning was Robert Englund. Not because of loyalty to Wes Craven or because he thought the script was bad, but because despite the budget for Freddy's Revenge being nearly triple the budget of the first film, Shea was still trying to save money, and he got it into his head that he could save some cash by having an extra wear a Freddy mask, not unlike an otherwise faceless and replaceable actor playing Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, since Freddy didn't really appear in that much of a story. But after a week of shooting, it was clear to everyone involved that they needed to get England back in the makeup chair and on screen as everyone's favorite child killer. The movie would begin production in Los Angeles in June of 1985 and would need to be completed in four weeks since New Line had already set a November 1st, 1985 release date for the film. Shoulder was a competent director and was able to bring the film in on time and on budget. The first wave of the release of Freddy's Revenge would find the film playing on 522 screens, mainly in New York City, Detroit, Washington, D.C., Dallas, Houston, and Austin, more than triple the first movie's opening weekend release, and it would come in second place with $3.87 million. The third Death Wish movie would come in first with $5.32 million, but it would be playing on more than 900 extra screens. And just like the first film, Freddy's Revenge would have the highest per-screen average of any film in the top 15. The critics, most of whom weren't that fond of Craven's movie, would be mixed on this one as well. But when did horror fans even care about the critics? They would keep the film going until April 1986, still making close to a million dollars a weekend into its 25th week of release. The film would gross $29,999,213. Why not just go for the $30 million? I don't know, but that reminds me of a story I need to tell when I finally get around to talking about Parenthood and Ron Howard's 1980s output. One person who was critical of the film was Wes Craven. Although writer David Chaskin had implemented some of Craven's story suggestions, Craven wasn't too fond of Freddy being turned into a comedian and some kind of hero. He felt bringing Freddy into the realm of reality the way the film did would weaken the character. So, he would do something about it. He would agree to at least write the story for a potential third entry into the series. Unbeknownst to Robert Shea, Craven intended this to be the end of Freddy Krueger. Unbeknownst to Craven, both John Saxon and Robert Englund were also writing their own screenplays for a third film. Saxon's story would have been a prequel, delving further into what happened between Freddy and the parents of Springwood that would lead to the teenager killer we all now know. Saxon would prove Freddy innocent by pinning the murders on the Manson family, making Freddy and his lynching all that more tragic. England's script called Freddy's Funhouse would have seen Freddy go up against Tina's sister, who was away at college when Tina was murdered by Freddy, coming back home to Springwood to avenge her sister's death, in part by following Nancy's playbook for going after Freddy. Part of this script would end up being used in the pilot episode of the Freddy's Nightmare TV series, but again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Craven and his writing partner, novelist Bruce Wagner, would fashion a story around a group of teenagers who had been admitted to a psychiatric hospital, all of whom are being tormented by Freddy Krueger in their dreams. 
Bringing them back into Craven's original mythology for A Nightmare on Elm Street, these teenagers are their final kids still alive from the parents who lynched and burned Freddy to death many years earlier. The subtitle of the film, Dream Warriors, would be based on the teens' ability to fight Freddy when they team together, when they are all asleep. And they are assisted by Nancy, who is now an intern therapist at the hospital. After Craven turned in his script with Wagner, Robert Shea would bring Frank Darabont, who at the time had only written and directed The Woman in the Room, a short film based on a story by Stephen King, and Chuck Russell, who had written the 1984 Dennis Quaid film Dreamscape, to rewrite the script. Shea would be so excited by Russell's passion for the project, wanting to take the story even further into Freddy's dream world, that Shea would hire the writer to direct the film, even though Russell had no experience as a director before. Dream Warriors would be the first major acting role for Patricia Arquette, playing Kristen, one of the Springwood teens, and the one who was able to pull the other characters into the dream world. The film also features Craig Wasson as the doctor caring for the teams, Larry Fishburne as Max, one of the orderlies at the hospital, and then-up-and-coming actors like Jennifer Rubin and Rodney Eastman. The new film would have a budget of $4.5 million, more than the first two films' combined budget, and would begin shooting around Los Angeles on July 28, 1986, with a planned release date already set for February 27, 1987. This would give Russell six months after the completion of shooting to get his film into shape, a luxury neither Craven nor Shoulder were afforded. As previously noted, Craven intended Dream Warriors to be the final movie in the Elm Street series, but of course Robert Shea would have other ideas. He would make sure Russell shot the ending to be as ambiguous as possible, so in case there was a fan demand for another movie, it could be met. There would be a fan demand for a fourth Elm Street movie. Dream Warriors would be the first movie in the series to get a wide national theatrical release. In fact, it would be New Line's first movie to open in more than a thousand theaters on the initial break, in 1,343 screen. That would be more than double the previous, widest New Line release, April 1986's Critters, which opened in 633 theaters. And Dream Warriors would be the first Elm Street movie to get a predominantly positive rating from the critics. That first weekend, Dream Warriors would open in first place with $8.9 million in its first three days. It would be the biggest opening weekend ever to date for an independent release. It would fall to second place in its second weekend, bested by the opening weekend of Lethal Weapon, but only by about $86,000. Dream Warriors would stay in the top ten for seven weeks, an unusually long time for a horror film. And after five months in theaters, the film would end its theatrical run with $44.79 million. Wes Craven was asked to return to at least write, if not also direct, the fourth Elm Street movie. Craven said he would on two conditions. It absolutely had to be the final movie in the series, and that the new film be far different from the previous films. Namely, the characters fighting Freddy this time around would time travel within dreams, breaking all the established rules of dreams. It shouldn't have been too much of a stretch since Freddy was already breaking established rules of dreams, but the pitch was just too much for New Line. Enter William Kotzwinkel. At the time, Kotzwinkel was best known as a novelist who mainly wrote for children, having written both the 1982 novelization of the screenplay for E.T. the Extraterrestrial and the 1985 sequel book, E.T. the Book of the Green Planet. Kotzwinkel wasn't exactly a fan of the Elm Street series, but someone was offering a payday to come up with a storyline, and he did. It would be Kotzwinkel who would come up with the film's Dream Master idea, which would also be the subtitle for the film. But the script he would churn in would be too expensive to film. They would ask Kotzwinkel for a rewrite, but the author was already hard at work on his next novel. Enter Brian Hageland. Today, you know Brian Hagelin as the Oscar-winning co-writer of the best film of 1997, L.A. Confidential, and the writer-director of the Mel Gibson revenge thriller, Payback, and the Jackie Robinson movie 42 that would catapult Chadwick Boseman to stardom. But in 1987, he was just another screenwriter trying to make it in Hollywood. He and his writing partner at the time, Rhett Topham, had sold their first screenplay called 976 Evil, 
to the independent production company Cinetel Films, which would become Robert England's first movie as a director. England had enjoyed working with Hegeland on the film and would recommend the young writer to Robert Shea to take a crack at Kotwinkel's first draft. Hegeland would be offered the job on the condition that the new draft of the script be turned into New Line within two weeks. Hegeland would head back to his parents' house, lock himself in his room, and FedEx his rewrite to New Line nine days later. New Line felt it was a better script, but there was still something missing. So they would turn to the Wheat Brothers, Ken and Jim, who had written the moderately successful 1979 horror film Silent Screen, and had written and directed one of the Ewok television movies for George Lucas, The Battle for Endor. Satisfied with the final script, New Line would go on the hunt for a director. Tom McLaughlin, who had just completed shooting the sixth Friday the 13th movie, Jason Lives, was approached to take the reins on the film, but he would, after his experiences on the other horror icon film, accept on the condition that he be given complete creative control on the film. New Line's response? They had already started shooting the film. New Line had hired two second units to start shooting the various visual effects needed on the film, since second unit and effects are regularly done outside of the direction of the director, because as usual, they wanted to get the film completed and into theaters as quickly as possible. McLaughlin would not sign on. The directing job would go to a little-known Finnish-born filmmaker named Rennie Harland, who had made the 1986 Mike Norris action film Born American and the 1987 horror film Prison for Empire Pictures. This time, Shea would have a second producer on the film, Rachel Talalay, who had worked as an effects supervisor on the first three films. New Line was growing as a company, in large part to the Nightmare on Elm Street series, and Shea needed to focus on the overall company. In The Dream Master, Freddy Krueger has completed his initial evil mission of killing all of the kids of the people whose actions resulted in his death. But now Freddy was so addicted to killing that he would now use the body of one of the major character's best friends to continue his killing spree, not unlike the plot of Freddy's Revenge. Originally planned for a Halloween 1988 release, Robert Shea decided just as filming was about to begin in April that the film needed instead to be released no later than the end of August, which would put an incredible strain on the director and the cast since it would give the production less than five months to get a completed film into shape. It also didn't help that the Writers Guild of America had gone on strike in March 1988, and as a signatory of the Writers Guild, New Line could not bring Craven or Hageland or the Wheat Brothers back to work on the script if necessary, nor could they bring in any other writer, whether they were a member of the Guild or not. As filming went on, it became clear to everyone that there were scenes in the script that just weren't working on set. But what do you do when you can't bring in any writer to do some spot rewriting? Improvise! Many of the dream sequences, whose effects had already been completed before the movie started shooting, were created by Rennie Harlan on the spot. Lisa Wilcox and Andrus Jones, who played Alice and Rick in the film, would write out their own scenes and show them to Harlan for approval just before cameras would roll on that scene. It was not a good way to make a film, and the haphazardness would reflect in the final film and add an additional 20% to the original $5 million budget. Some critics like the usually stuffy Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times would praise the film's performances, storyline, and special effects, but most would note the lowering of quality after Dream Warriors. Audiences didn't care. As we established earlier, there was a voracious appetite for Freddy Krueger. Like Dream Warriors, Dream Master would set new records for the widest opening ever for an independent movie, 1,765 theaters, and the highest opening weekend gross, $12.88 million. Dream Master would stay as the number one movie in the nation for its first three weeks, and stay in the top ten for another four weeks after that. Its $49.37 million final gross would be the highest for an Elm Street movie for 15 more years, and it would be the 19th highest grossing movie of the entire year, a year that included huge hits like Big, Cocktail, Coming to America, Die Hard, Fish Called Wanda, Rain Man, Twins, and who framed Roger Rabbit. Not only was Dream Master a success, 
New Line would, while the film is still in the top ten at the box office, premiere a new syndicated show, Freddy's Nightmares, an anthology series not unlike The Twilight Zone, which would run for two seasons and 44 episodes. Freddy Fever had gripped American audiences, and Robert Shea wanted another movie as quickly as possible. And of all the pitches from writers that Shea and Sarah Risher had heard, they couldn't get Leslie Bohm's pitch for Dream Warriors out of their head. Risher no longer objected to one of the scenes Bohm had pitched, where the baby possessed by the spirit of Freddy claws its way out of the mother's womb. Risher herself would realize that teenagers who made the first Elm Street movie in 1984 a success were now growing up and starting families of their own, and they would bring Baum back to write a full screenplay. New Line would continue their tradition of giving a newer filmmaker a chance to make their mark on the Elm Street series, hiring Australian filmmaker Stephen Hopkins to direct the new film, subtitled The Dream Child. After working as the second unit director on the original Highlander film, Hopkins had made an exceptional but little-seen slasher film in his native country called Dangerous Game. The film had been submitted to New Line for an American acquisition, and while New Line passed on the film, it would hire its director. Again, dreams play a major role in the story, but the turning point of the script would be the revelation of Freddy's parentage. No spoilers here if you haven't seen it, but it was a game changer. At $8 million, it would be the most expensive Elm Street movie to date, and it would begin shooting in Los Angeles on April 7, 1989 with a targeted release date of August 9th, giving the filmmakers barely four months to complete the entire film. Thankfully, the writer's guilt strike had been settled a week after Dream Master was released in the theater, so New Line could have writers ready if there were any rewrites needed. Leslie Bohm would not be available for those rewrites, so the production would bring in the splatterpunk horror writing team of John Skip and Craig Spector to work on the script just before and during production the writing credits for the film would be a mess. The screenplay for the film would be solely credited to Leslie Boehm, while Boehm would also get a story by credit alongside Skip and Spectre, since the writer guild had determined the team's changes to the script were less than half of the film's running time, but they should still get some credit. And because we're now in the fifth film of a series with characters who had been introduced by different writers, there would also be a credit of based on characters created by that would list Wes Craven, and Bruce Wagner, and William Kotzwinkel, and Brian Hegeland. For the third year in a row, the release of a new Elm Street movie would set a new record for widest opening weekend release for an independent feature, with Dreamchild playing in 1,902 screens. But it would not be the first place movie that weekend, coming in third with $8.1 million in tickets sold behind Ron Howard's Parenthood, and James Cameron's The Abyss. It would fall to 8th place in its second week, and 11th and 14th in its next two weekends before dropping completely out of the top 20 by week 5. Its final gross of $22.1 million would be the lowest of the five Elm Street films released to date. Critics were not kind to the movie, giving the film the worst reviews of the series so far, and even Stephen Hopkins years later would admit that the biggest problems were having a budget that didn't match what he was trying to convey, that the film was too rushed through production and post-production to meet an arbitrary deadline, and that the MPAA would give the film an X rating for its extreme violence and gore, forcing the production to trim or remove several major scenes, which would also mess with the continuity of the film. Because of this misstep, Robert Shea would take some time trying to get the sixth Elm Street movie off the ground. Amongst the filmmakers Shea would hear from concerning a potential storyline would be a young director from New Zealand who had directed two very bizarre comedies named Peter Jackson. Jackson would get his first American assignment writing a draft of the screenplay, which would feature a new group of teens who were not afraid of Freddy and would take sleeping pills in order to combat him in his own world. Rachel Towley who had worked her way up from the effects department on the first film to producing several of the later films, would herself get hired on as both writer and director. It would be her idea to not use Nightmare on Elm Street in the name of the new film, and to bring in more name actors and personalities in the film, including Yafet Koto, 
Tom Arnold and Roseanne Barr, Alice Cooper, and, for a very small cameo, Johnny Depp, who in the past seven years had become a major star. Talalay's biggest contribution would be to film the final ten minutes in 3D, a process that, outside of Earl Owensby, hadn't been used in a movie in eight years. After Talalay turned in her outline for the film, the screenplay for Freddy's Dead would be written by another New Lima employee, Michael DeLuca, who had been hired as a story editor by the company in 1985 and had quickly risen in the ranks to vice president by 1990. This would be DeLuca's first produced screenplay. Freddy's Dead would dive deeper into the psyche of Freddy Krueger, getting to know just how horrific his life was, and would introduce a major twist that, again, I will not be spoiling for you if you have not seen the film. In preparation for the release of the $11 million film, New Line would hold a mock funeral for Freddy Krueger at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which shares a border with the Paramount Studio lot. Most of the stars of the film would attend, along with Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley, who would, the following day, Friday, September 13, 1991, the day of the film's release, proclaim it to be Freddy Krueger Day in the city. This move would be highly criticized by a number of the mayor's critics who weren't too keen on a governmental proclamation glorifying a mass murderer, albeit a fictional mass murderer. The critics would lay into Freddy's dead even more than the dream child. Many critics would note how Freddy had changed from a truly terrifying character to a wisecracking goofball, and more than a few would complete their critiques with hopes that Freddy truly stayed dead. Audiences must have missed Freddy because they would buy $12.97 million worth of tickets in its first three days, knocking Kenneth Branagh's beautiful dead again out of the top spot after two weeks. Freddy's Dead would retain its number one gross spot in the second week, even though it lost nearly half its audience, but the joy would be short-lived. The following three weekends would see it fall to fourth, then eighth, then eleventh, before completely falling out of the top 20. Its final gross of $34.87 million was good, but not great. As he had with every other new Elm Street movie, Robert Shea approached Wes Craven about being involved in another installment. For years, Craven would decline the offer as he had been making movies with Universal Pictures, who had been trying to re-establish their own dominance in the re-emerged horror genre. But after 1988's The Serpent and the Rainbow, 1989's Shocker, and 1991's People Under the Stairs failed to catch on with horror audiences, Craven was ready to give Freddy one final shot. But he would need to have far more creative control on the new film than he ever had before. Shea, surprisingly, was on board. Craven would return to the storyline he had originally conceived for Dream Warriors with some changes. First, the new movie would not have any kind of continuation of the series that ended with Freddy's Dead. In fact, Freddy Krueger would barely be a part of the storyline. In the new film, Heather Langenkamp, Nancy in the original film, is pitched on making a new Elm Street movie by Robert Shea, playing himself. Heather isn't sure she wants to be a part of it, even after learning her special effects husband has been hired to work on the effects for the new Nightmare movie. While she doesn't take the role, Heather finds herself and her son being pulled deeper into the mythology of Freddy Krueger. There is a visit to Wes Craven, playing himself, where he and Heather talk about his belief that the films captured an ancient supernatural entity that had been freed with Freddy's dead, the end of the series. John Saxon, who had played Nancy's father in the first movie, comes back into Heather's life, concerned about her and her family's well-being. Robert England also seems to have some understanding of what Craven is talking about, and chooses to keep his distance from Heather for her own safety. In the climax, Heather and her son find themselves back in the fictional town of Springwood, Ohio, back in the Thompson house, with Saxon back as Nancy's father. Heather knows that, in order to beat Freddy once and for all, she will have to become Nancy again. There's a fantastic climax, and when it's over, Heather finds a copy of a screenplay at the foot of her son's bed, with a note written inside from Wes Craven thanking her for helping to imprison the entity once more. As she and Dylan read the screenplay, it mimics the actions we just saw on screen.
All things considered, the shoot for New Nightmare was a relative breeze. Craven would start shooting the film in October 1993, a full year before New Line planned on releasing the film. In one eerie moment of foreshadowing, Craven had written a scene for the film where the shooting of the new Elm Street movie would be interrupted by an earthquake. While they weren't filming at that time, the 1994 Northridge earthquake would halt filming on the movie for a few days, although Craven and a skeleton crew did drive around town to capture footage of the destruction that could be used in the film. The movie would be released on October 14, 1994 in 1,850 theaters, and it would enjoy the best reviews of any of the Elm Street movies. Critics loved how Craven played with the mythology he himself had created, how deftly he was able to weave fact and fiction together, and how he made Freddy Krueger scary again. But whether it was audience fatigue of a seventh Elm Street movie in ten years, or audiences not being given the wisecracking hooligan they had become accustomed to over the past few films, or that audiences really wanted to see Pulp Fiction more, which had opened the same day. But New Nightmare would only open to third place with $6.67 million, more than $2.5 million behind Pulp Fiction and a million and a half behind the god-awful Sylvester Stallone movie The Specialist, which was in its second week of release. New Nightmare would never recover. It would fall to 7th place in its second weekend, to 8th in its third, and to 13th in its fourth, before falling out of the top 20. Its $18.1 million final box office gross would make New Nightmare the lowest grossing Freddy movie, and essentially put the final nail in the coffin on the series. In 2002, Robert Shea would hire Wes Craven's old friend, Friday the 13th producer-director Sean S. Cunningham, to produce a crossover film between Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. Attempts to make a Freddy vs. Jason movie had been happening since 1987, when Frank Mancuso Jr., who had taken over producing the Friday the 13th series starting with Part 2, tried to get Tom McLaughlin, the director of Jason Lives, who had been in contention to direct the fourth Elm Street movie, to try and unite New Line and Paramount Pictures to get a pairing movie made. But it didn't happen. After the failure of Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, the rights to Jason Voorhees passed from Paramount Pictures to some of the producers of the series, who would end up selling those rights to New Line Cinema. Joseph Zito, the director of choice for many of Canon Films' biggest hits, who also directed Friday the 13th Part 4, The Final Chapter, almost got a spin-off pairing movie off the ground in 1992. But in the end, Shea went with Craven and New Nightmare instead. In 1994, there was almost a crossover film with several writers or teams of writers taking a swing at the story. One team, Brandon Braga and Ronald D. Moore from Star Trek The Next Generation, would turn in Jason vs. Freddy, which threw traditional horror film conventions out the window and attempted to make a serious, more adult-toned horror film. New Line would then bring British writer Peter Briggs in, having been impressed with Briggs' unmade screenplay for Aliens vs. Predator. Briggs' story would bring back many of the characters from both series together. In 1996, the writers of the Tales from the Crypt movie Demon Knight were brought in for a different take, and Robert Shea would go as far as to hire special makeup effects wizard Rob Bowden to make his directorial debut, after both Guillermo del Toro and Peter Jackson churned the film down. Bowden would throw out that script and bring in David S. Goyer, who would be best known a few years later for writing the Blade movies, to flesh out a story that Boaten had come up with. In 1998, Boaten was still attached to the crossover movie, but now two of the staff writers on the animated sitcom King of the Hill were brought in to take a stab at it. When their take didn't take, it was next up to comic book writer Mark Verheiden, who had helped New Line to adapt Dark Horse's The Mask comic book into a movie to try and make something work. Several years and several more writers later, New Line finally found the right pair to come up with a story. Mark Swift and Damian Shannon had originally been hired by New Line in 2000 to write an adaptation of the comic book Danger Girl. While New Line wouldn't pursue that film, Shea was impressed enough with the writers to bring them in on Friday vs. Jason. In 
And whether it was a really good script or the fact that Shea had already spent nearly 15 years and more than $6 million trying to get a working screenplay that could be made into a movie, their take on the pairing of iconic horror characters would be the one to get made. Shea would offer the directing gig to Wes Craven first, but Wes was back on top of the movie world. Having directed Scream and Scream 2 after New Nightmare, and would decline the offer. As would Guillermo del Toro, who had just made Blade 2 for New Line, and Rob Zombie, who was transitioning from cult rock star to filmmaker, and wanted to focus on what was going to be his directorial debut, House of a Thousand Corpses. Finally, Hong Kong director Ronnie Yu, who had made a successful American directing debut in 1998 with Bride of Chucky, would sign on to make the film. It was never a question that Robert Englund would come back to play Freddy, but you specifically wanted a different actor than Kane Hodder to play Jason. He wanted to highlight the different characteristics of the two villains. And while the 6'3 Kane Hodder would have towered over the 5'9 inch Robert Englund, you wanted the difference to be even more pronounced and would hire 6'5 inch Ken Kurzinger who had doubled for Hotter in two scenes in Jason Takes Manhattan, to take over the role. Like with Craven on New Nightmare, you would be given more creative control than previous filmmakers in the series had, and would be given a comfortable 11 months to get the film ready for release when the cameras rolled in Vancouver in September 2002. While the film's official budget was $30 million, you would only have $23 million to actually make the movie, since New Line had spent all that other money on all the various scripts over the years. As if a budget higher than the cost of the first four Elm Street films combined could be considered, quote, only, unquote. Most critics would not be excited about the pairing of the two horror franchises, but horror fans had been waiting for years for this to happen. Opening in 3,014 theaters on August 15, 2003, Freddy vs. Jason would open in first place, earning $36.4 million in its first three days. For comparison's sake, the first Elm Street had only grossed $25.6 million in its entire run, while the first Friday the 13th movie grossed $39.8 million in its entire run. That $36.4 million gross would be more than double the amount of the second place movie SWAT took in the same weekend. The film would hang on to first place for a second week, despite losing more than 63% of its audience, and it would be a quick fall after that. Freddy vs. Jason would drop out of the top 10 in its fifth week of release, out of the top 20 the following week, and out of the top 30 the week after that. The final gross for the film, $82.6 million, would be more than the previous three Elm Street movies had grossed combined, or more than the last five Friday the 13th movies combined. And then there's the 2010 remake co-produced by Michael Bay. The less said about that film, the better. Suffice it to say it would be highly ironic that Jackie Earl Haley, who had lost the audition for Glenn in the very first Elm Street movie 26 years earlier, would be cast in the remake as Freddy Krueger. The film would be a financial success, earning $63 million in ticket sales in the United States and another $52.6 million in the rest of the world, making it the highest-earning movie in the Elm Street cinematic universe. But it would also be the lowest-rated Elm Street movie by critics who genuinely saw no reason to remake a film that over the previous quarter century had been reassessed critically and was now deemed a high point in 1980s horror cinema. As I've stated on this show before, I am not a big fan of horror films. But I do think the original Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Warriors, and New Nightmare are genuinely good movies. Especially New Nightmare, which is on par with Dracula, Frankenstein, The Exorcist, and Jaws for me, as the best of what horror cinema can be. And it's not coincidental that Wes Craven is the connective tissue between the three movies. I watched all of the Elm Street movies again this past month preparing for this episode, not having seen a number of them since their original theatrical releases, and my opinion of each movie had not changed in all that time. And with that, we end this first part of our two-part miniseries about the history of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, 
Part two will be released later today and will be a discussion between myself and Jeff Townsend, podcast father, and the person who suggested this episode. I thought it might be interesting to talk to someone of a different generation than my own about how they saw a film series that was multiple episodes into itself before that person was even born. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it was actually interesting or not. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again after the second part of this miniseries next Thursday, when episode 92 on the forgotten 1987 crime drama Positive ID is released. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, the80smoviepodcast.com, for extra materials about Wes Craven and the movies we covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night.